Hi, welcome to Numerics Video Log. I'm your host, Jim Jockel, and with me today, Denny Yu from our Numerics Client Solutions Group. Thank you, Denny, for joining us. Thank you for having me. So let's talk about FVA, all right? Over the past year, Basel III introductions, CVA charges, essentially bringing the management of credit risk into the market risk sensitive type instruments. And it's been hotly debated. So we've had DVA, CVA, now the issue is FVA, funding valuation adjustments. Let's start with a definition because I don't think there's consensus on one. Right, so let's just take a quick step back into the origins of FVA. So after the financial crisis, regulation has been put in place for CVA and for the DVA calculation. So that's become pretty clear, and that's to incorporate the counterparty credit risk into the transaction, into the OTC derivative transaction. Now, post-crisis, we've seen the market move away from funding at the LIBOR rate into using a rate typically that's higher than LIBOR. And so for collateralized transaction, funding typically is done using the overnight rate, Fed Fund Futures for the U.S., for collateralized securities. And it's clear now that the market has moved to valuing these derivatives using an OES benchmark rate. From the unsecuritized collateral perspective, the unsecured um, derivatives perspective, what we've seen is a large dispute in terms of correct valuation. So funding value adjustment, in summary, really means that now traders have to own the cost of funding that derivative transaction, whether it's funding for the swap transaction, funding for the premium on the option, as well as the appropriate discount rate for discounting future cash flows. So now that has to be incorporated into the desk or the trader's P&L, where before uh, it typically was not a concern because things were funded at LIBOR. So now well, you mentioned something in terms of collateralized versus uncollateralized. Um, and clearly there's been a lot of debate lately around uncollateralized trades. Why don't you have some insight uh, between what's going on there? Right, so if we look at what a collateralized trade is, typically there's a CSA agreement between the two counterparties. And in most states now, we've seen a daily collateral call frequency, which means that on a daily basis, the counterparties mark the positions, and if one side has positive exposure, that side can call for additional collateral to make the credit derivative or the collateralized derivative whole. Uh, what that means is that um, we now can receive and post collateral on a daily basis. One way I've heard of calculating the FBA on collateralized transactions is to think of the CSA today that has parameters such as minimum transfer amounts, collateral thresholds, rounding, uh, other parameters that introduce friction into the CSA means that the full collateral that really needs to be collected to immunize that credit exposure is not collected. Contrast that with what we would call a perfect CSA where there are no thresholds. As soon as you call for collateral, you get it instantaneously. And if you calculate the difference between how much collateral you would have collected in a perfect CSA versus today's current CSA, and take that difference and multiply it by the funding spread, that would be considered your funding value adjustment for collateralized securities. Now, but what you're saying here, uh, in an absence of a perfect CSA or an absence of a CSA altogether, there's considerable valuation challenges in terms of, of what the mark is between counterparties. Is that correct? That is correct. So the, the biggest challenge right now is finding the appropriate funding spread. Mm -hmm. So one way we can think about a funding value adjustment is the sum between a funding charge adjustment and a funding benefit adjustment. And a funding charge adjustment is really the trading desk typically has to finance from the, the financing desk of the bank at some charge and typically this is some spread that the bank pays to the marketplace. So that's straightforward to calculate. The funding benefit really is for exposure that is uncollateralized, whether it's because of an imperfect CSA or because it's uncollateralized derivatives in general, the bank essentially enjoys a benefit by not having to finance that collateral. And so there's there's debate on uh, the the correct funding spread to be used there. Is it the financing spread of the bank? Is it an aggregate spread of the bank? And in general, from a funding spread perspective, there's a lot of dispute on the correct or appropriate spread to use, whether it's the funding spread of the bank taken from the bond markets of that, that bank's bonds or the CDS rate of that, of that bank or even the basis between the cash synthetic or the basis between the bond spreads and the CDS spreads. So now, what's the implication for 
the buy side participant or the corporate participant um, outside of you know the bank to bank relationships right what we've seen here largely when we speak to our clients and speak to industry market participants is that because of the valuation differences when a bank includes their FA into the economic value and essentially quote this to corporates or other uh, interbroker dealers what you'll see is that this can be vastly different from the mark to market value that the corporate calculates which is typically a risk neutral price that may or may not include that corporate's funding costs or even between banks if one bank has uh, a funding spread of LIBOR plus 50 and another has LIBOR plus 150 they're going to come to the table with vastly different valuations and then that you can see how this in the industry can cause a lot of disputes in terms of just marking to market. So final question uh, and we'll wrap up because I think we're going to be talking about this for a while so next steps in the market uh, clearly um, we got to get on the same page clearly there's a lot of potential for discrepancies what do you see as the interim next steps so just like we've seen regulation come down the pipeline and legislation come down for the CVA calculation both on the financial accounting side as well as on the regulatory capital side we'd expect either regulation to figure out how much the FEA calculation should fac in factor into both on a accounting standard as well as a regulatory standard. So we're either looking for something coming down from regulation or looking from industry consensus from the banks themselves either organizing and coming to a, a mainstream consensus as to what the calculation should be. If you go online today you can find multiple papers on different ways of calculating the FEA. And so there's still a wide disparity in, in opinions on how to calculate that. Major bank broker dealers today are calculating a certain way uh, second tier, third tier institutions are typically price takers in that sense. So until the playing field is leveled with regulation or legislation or industry consensus, we're going to continue seeing these valuation disputes. Thank you, Denny. So this is going to be a continuing uh, topic of conversation on the Numerics Video Log, and I would encourage you to join at the debate. Tweet us at nxanalytics.com, and as news and events are breaking in the market, we'll be sure to be covering them. Thank you.